If you have a Bible, and I hope you do, do please to, turn with me to the book of Exodus. We'll be looking this morning at Exodus chapter 23, verses 20 through 33. Exodus chapter 23, verses 20 through 33. Before I read this, I would remind you, as we often do, that what we're about to do is hear from the word of the living God. So let us have our minds and hearts ready to do just that. Exodus chapter 23, beginning in verse 20. Behold, I send an angel before you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place that I have prepared. Pay careful attention to him and obey his voice. Do not rebel against him, for he will not pardon your transgression, for my name is in him. But if you carefully obey his voice and do all that I say, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. When my angel goes before you and brings you to the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites, and the Canaanites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and I blot them out. You shall not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do as they do, but you shall utterly overthrow them and break their pillars in pieces. You shall serve the Lord your God, and he will bless your bread and your water, and I will take sickness away from you. None shall miscarry or be barren in your land. I will fulfill the number of your days. I will send my terror before you and will throw into confusion all the people against whom you shall come. And I will make all your enemies turn their backs to you. And I will send hornets before you, which shall drive out the Hivites, the Canaanites, and the Hittites from before you. I will not drive them out from before you in one year, lest the land become desolate and the wild beasts multiply against you. Little by little, I will drive them out from before you until you have increased and possessed the land. And I will set your border from the Red Sea to the Sea of the Philistines and from the wilderness to the Euphrates. For I will give the inhabitants of the land into your hand and you shall drive them out before you. You shall make no covenant with them and their gods. They shall not dwell in your land, lest they make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would give us your grace during this time, that by your spirit you would illuminate our minds and our hearts, so that as we study your word, we would be changed. We pray that this would not be an exercise in futility, but that this would be a spiritually formative, life-changing moment. We pray this in Christ's name and for his glory. Amen. Well, in just a few days, my wife and I will celebrate our anniversary. With that in mind, let me share with you an example of how I recently knocked it out of the park in terms of being a good and godly husband. <laughs> For those of you who are visiting, I am totally being sarcastic. <laughs> Just disclaimer. Transitions are never easy, are they? And transitions can be particularly difficult for families. Our family is no different. As most of you know, we're going through a season of transition, preparing to move overseas. In fact, the unknowns of our current transition make it all the more difficult. And in a moment of vulnerability, uh, about 10 days ago, my wife said to me one evening, I had trouble falling asleep last night. I was tossing and turning for what seemed like an hour. And when I asked her what was keeping her up, she said this, I had this overwhelming sense of homesickness. 
Now, being the godly and understanding husband that I am, I immediately thought to myself, that makes no sense at all. <laughs> we are quite literally sitting in our home in the neighborhood that we have lived in for almost nine years. Thankfully, I did not say that. <laughs> Some smidgen of sensitivity prevailed, and I asked her what she meant by that. Just pro tip for all you husbands out there. And she said, I just feel like I'm not going to be at home anywhere for the next year of life. We'll either be getting ready to leave, we'll be leaving, or we'll be getting used to somewhere new, and I just want the home of what is just normal. Now, I have to admit that even after that insightful answer, I still had no idea what she was talking about. But as I reflected on our conversation in relationship to our passage this morning, I think it began to make a little sense. See, we, all of us, every single one of us, and not just us, but every single human being, we were made for home. We were made for a place and for a people where we could truly be ourselves, where we could truly feel secure, where we could truly feel welcomed, where we could truly feel at rest. We were made for home. The problem is that home was lost in Genesis 3. Adam and Eve, because of their rebellion against God, were kicked out of their home, the home that God had specially created for them and for their offspring. And ever since then, humankind has longed for, it has ached for, it has been homesick for a home that they have never been able to locate or build or pay for. This is what G.K. Chesterton once wrote. For men are homesick in their homes and strangers under the sun, and they lay their heads in a foreign land whenever the day is done. Friends, that is all of us. That is our entire earthly existence. Even if you've lived in the same house your entire life, even if your family has lived in the same state, in the same city, on the same plot of land for generations upon generations upon generations, it doesn't matter. Deep down inside our souls, we are men and women who are homesick in our homes. And in our passage today, the people of God who had essentially been homeless for more than 400 years are told that they are going home. Home to a place that they had never seen, to a place that had been promised to their forefathers, home to the land of Canaan. And the main point of our passage is this. God promises to safely lead his people to and give them a home if they keep his covenant. God promises to safely lead his people to and to give them a home if they keep his covenant. Now, we're going to arrange our thoughts about this passage by seeking to answer three questions this morning. Let's start with the first question. Who is the angel sent by God? At the center of our passage is, is this angel. Who is this angel sent by God? Well, let's start with verse 20. Verse 20, God says this, Behold, I send an angel before you. Now, we have seen angels before in the book of Exodus. So the first time we see this is back in Exodus chapter 3, verse 2. 
And here we read this. And the angel of Yahweh appeared to him, that is to Moses, in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, Moses, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And in our study of Exodus 3, we argued that the angel of Yahweh was actually no one less than Yahweh himself. Okay? Later in Exodus 14, verse 19, while the people are fleeing from Egypt, we read this. Then the angel of God, who was going before the host of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them. Now watch what happens in a few verses. Verse 24. This is how verse 24 reads. And in the morning watch, Yahweh in the pillar of fire and of cloud, looked down. And so what do we see when we put those two verses together? That it seems like the angel of God that is represented in the pillar is no one less than Yahweh himself. So in the two instances in which the angel of God is used in Exodus, we see that the angel of God is actually God himself. And I think the same thing is going on here in Exodus 23. God says to Moses back in verse 20, Behold, I send an angel before you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place that I have prepared. The word angel there can also be translated something like messenger or representative. And my argument is that this is no one less than Yahweh himself. Why do I argue that? Well, look at the qualities and the authority given to this angel. Verse 21, pay careful attention to him and obey his voice. Do not rebel against him, for he will not pardon your transgression, for my name is in him. There's so much there. The people are to obey him. They are not to rebel against him. He has the authority to forgive, to pardon sins. Angels don't have that authority. God has that authority. Additionally, right, it says that the name of God, right, that is Yahweh, is in him. Remember that the name of God represents his character and his authority. And the name of God is in this one sent by Yahweh. It resides in him. It rests in him. In every way, shape, and form, it is his name. Additionally, look at verse 22. It says there, But if you carefully obey his voice and do all that I say. You see that? Notice that the voice of the angel and the voice of Yahweh are interchangeable there, right? Obey his voice and do all that I say. So who is this angel that God is sending before his people? I would argue it's himself. But that doesn't really make sense, does it? That God sends himself? And that's why we need to go one step further here. We're going to just jump in a little bit to the deep end of theology here. I believe that this figure is no one less than the pre-incarnate Son of God. That's who I believe we're talking about here. We don't call him Jesus because that earthly name is not given to him until his incarnation. Nor do we call him Christ because that title isn't given to him until his incarnation. Rather, this is the Son of God prior to his incarnation, right? Think about it and marvel at this. Over 1,500 years before the Son of God ever takes on human flesh, he is present and active in the history of the universe and in the redemption of his people. Indeed, as we argue during our series on the Trinity, the Son of God has existed in perfect fellowship with and sharing the glory of God the Father and God the Spirit for all eternity. And I think what we have here in Exodus 23 is an instance of God the Father sending God the Son to lead, to guard, and to deliver Israel safely into their home 
the promised land. Now, I don't want to show you all my cards just yet, but let me say that phrase just one more time. What we see here is God the Father sending God the Son to lead, to guard, and to deliver his people safely to their home. Is that... Does that sound familiar, church? We'll get there, don't worry. That's our first question, okay? Second question that I want us to consider this morning. What does God promise to do for his people? What does God promise to do for his people? We're going to drill down a bit deeper here, but I just want to briefly read for you how God-centered this passage is. Okay? This is what God says he will do. I will send an angel to guard you and bring you to the place that I have prepared. Verse 20. I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. Verse 21. I will blot the Canaanites out. Verse 23. I will bless your bread and water. Verse 25. I will take sickness away. Verse 25. I will fulfill the number of your days, verse 26. I will send my terror before you, verse 27. I will make your enemies turn their backs to you, verse 27. I will send hornets before you, verse 28. I will drive the Canaanites out, verse 30. I will give the inhabitants of the land into your hand, verse 31. This is a stunningly God-centered passage. Now, when we look at all of those I will statements, we can sort them into three categories, okay? First, I will defeat your enemies. I will defeat your enemies. Verse 22, I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. Now, think about that phrase there. For those of you who are keeping track That language there should immediately remind us of something that's come in Moses' first book, which is the book of Genesis, okay? Where where does it come? God's covenant with Abraham, right? Genesis 12, 3, I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And as we walk through Abraham's life, we see that God keeps this promise to Abraham. To to those who side with Abraham, they receive the blessing of God. To those who stand against Abraham, they are stood against by God. And what God does here is he takes his promise to Abraham and he makes it to rest on the entire nation of Israel. Uh, Look back at verse 23. Here God lists six of the seven people groups that were known to occupy the promised land. So so we need to remember that when Israel enters into the promised land, it's not uninhabited, right? It was a land that was teeming with different people groups. And all of these people groups, all of these nations were both larger and stronger than Israel, right? And Israel was not not a nation that for 400 years had been practicing their uh, military operations. For 400 plus years, they had been enslaved. And we read there in verse 23 that God says of these stronger and mightier and bigger nations, I will blot them out. The the verb there, to blot out, it literally means to hide or to conceal. And the idea here is that God will utterly annihilate these nations. Now, look at verse, uh, look at Deuteronomy 7.1. In Deuteronomy 7.1, we read this. When Yahweh your God brings you into the land that you are entering to take possession of it and clears away Many nations before you, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations more numerous and mightier 
than you. And that's who Israel's facing. Seven nations more numerous and mightier than you. This is not just David versus Goliath. This is David versus seven Goliaths. And God acting on behalf of the smaller and the weaker Israelites promises that he will utterly annihilate. He will blot out these nations. Look back at verse 27 in our passage. I will send my terror before you and will throw into confusion all the people against whom you shall come, and I will make your enemies turn their backs to you. What we have pictured here is Yahweh as a mighty warrior, right? He is the one who stands at the head of his troops, right? He is the one who unleashes a terrifying weapon. We don't know exactly what my terror is. We're not, it's, not, it's not clear, but Yahweh unleashes it and it confuses the enemies and it's so terrifying that it causes them to retreat. Right, that's why they have turned their backs. They are running away in retreat. God's first promise is that he will defeat the enemies of his people. Okay, the second thing we see here is, uh, just, just let me pause real quick. I had this in my notes, and then I took it out, but I'm, I'm putting it back in here again. Okay? God promises to stand against those who would curse or dishonor Abraham. Right? God promises to stand against the enemies of his people Israel here in the book of Exodus. Church, we might feel small and insignificant, but we need to know that that same promise is ours today, right? God will stand against those who stand against his church here in North Korea, in China, in Afghanistan, in Somalia, wherever his people are oppressed and imprisoned and persecuted, the enemies of God's people need to know that God will stand for his people, period, and a paragraph, and a story. Amen? Okay, that's the first point. Second point, I will deliver you home. I will deliver you home. Look back at verse 20. I will send an angel before you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place that I have prepared. I love this verse, right? It's not just that God delivered his people from Egypt. It's not just that God would protect his people through their dangerous journey in the wilderness. It's that God would usher them home right, into the place that he had prepared for them and he would bring them there safely. And the same could be true of us, church, said of us, church. We need to think holistically about the work of God in our lives. It's not just that God saves us, which he has, right? And it's not just that God sustains us in this fallen world. It's that God will safely bring us home, he will safely deliver us to our eternal home. He is the God who saves. He is the God who sustains. And he is the God who safely delivers us home. Our redemption is from end to end. And it is all of God. Amen? Note, note something else about this. In verses 29 and 30, we see this. And I love this. He says in verse 29, I will not drive them out before you in one year, lest the land become desolate and the wild beasts multiply against you. Little by little, I will drive them out from before you until you have increased and possessed the land. Okay, there are two things that we need to understand about these two verses. Okay, the first thing that we need to know here is the practicality of it, right? God could have, in an instant, dispatched of all seven of the Canaanite nations, right? But he doesn't. Why? 
Because he knows, just in practical terms, Israel needed time to move into the land and then to portion out the land by tribes and then for those tribes to settle into their inheritance and then for them to build houses and then for them to get what they needed to get in place so that they could begin to farm the land. I I love this. Because God is thinking about the details of what will make his people successful in the promised land. On a scale of more detailed to less detailed, I tend toward the more detailed side. Any of you who have worked with me know this. But sometimes I find myself believing the lie that I am more detailed than God. (laughs) And that's just not true. God is going to help the people drive the nations out of the land little by little. Why? So that they have time to get settled. And guess who's going to maintain the land for them while they're moving in? The very enemies that they're going to kick out. So he is using those seven Canaanite nations to continue to till the land and get it ready for his people. And when the time is right, they're going to get expelled out of the land. God cares about the details, all of them. The second thing we need to see is the creation imagery and the creation language used in these two verses. Okay, so go back to verse 29. In this verse, we see this idea that that if God were to, in one year, kick out all of the, the other nations, that the land would potentially become desolate. You see that in there? Literally, it would become ruined or devastated. And then we see this idea of of wild animals multiplying against the people of Israel. What is this a picture of? It's a picture of the opposite of the Garden of Eden. Okay? In the Garden of Eden, the land was anything but desolate, ruined, or devastated. The land was perfect. It was lush. It was pristine. It was orderly. Similarly, in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve had what? Dominion over the animals. They lived in harmony with the animals in the garden because they rightly had authority over the animals. And verse 29 is a picture of Eden inverted. Now look at verse 30. I will drive them out before you until you have increased and possess the land. That word increased is one of the most important words in the Torah. It is the word multiplied, as in be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So what is Moses doing here? Moses is depicting the promised land as an echo of the Garden of Eden. And as God moves the enemies of the people of God out of the promised land and ushers his people into the promised land. His intention is that they would be fruitful, that they would multiply, that they would possess the land, and that they would exercise dominion over the created order in the land and that the land would not be devastated or ruined, but that the land itself would be fruitful. What is he doing? God is bringing his people home. He is initiating a recovery of what was lost in the Garden of Eden. Okay? Third, I will bless you. So I will defeat your enemies. I will deliver you home. I will bless you. In the middle of our passage are all of these blessings the people will experience in the land. We see it in verses 25 and 26. I will bless your bread and your water, and I will take sickness away from among you. Verse 26, none shall miscarry or be barren in your land. I will fulfill the number of your days. Now, in light of what I just said, 
We need to think about those verses carefully. So the first thing we need to know is that these types of blessings are going to be repeated in the book of Deuteronomy. So when we get to Deuteronomy, there's a list of blessings and curses for the people if they disobey or obey the covenant. Okay. But the other thing we need to hear here, hear here is that these are echoes of Eden. <laughs> Right? Think about it. Prior to Adam and Eve getting kicked out of the Garden of Eden, these things were all assumed. They had an abundance of food and water. There was no sickness. There was no miscarriage. There was no barrenness. There was no pain in childbearing or labor. And their lives were to be lived to the full numbers of their days. What does God say? God says that this is the type of blessing that awaits his people when they arrive in their new home. It is Eden-like in its anticipation. The people of God kicked out of their original home in Eden. The people of God enslaved in Egypt for over 400 years are now heading to a home that they have never seen, an Eden-like paradise, a land flowing with milk and honey, a place filled with the blessings and the presence of God. They are going home. Okay? This brings us to our third point this morning. There's just one simple stipulation for them, and it's obedience. And this is our final question. What is required of the people of God? What is required of the people of God? Two specific requirements are given in our passage, and both are tied to Canaan. First, reject the gods of Canaan. Reject the gods of Canaan. Look at verse 24. You shall not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do as they do, but you shall utterly overthrow them and break their pillars in pieces. Let's unpack that verse a little bit. The first thing that I want you to notice is that word serve. You see that there? That word has been key in our study of the book of Exodus. The first place we saw that word serve was back in Exodus 1.13. We read there that the Egyptians ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves. That word slaves is the same word. Now, contrast that with Exodus 3.12. Yahweh says to Moses via the burning bush, that he will redeem the people so that when they are brought out of Egypt, they shall do what? They shall serve God on this mountain. It's the same exact word. So what do we see here? That the people are saved from service to Pharaoh and Egypt, and they are saved to service to Yahweh. Okay? And then a chapter later, Yahweh has Moses say this to Pharaoh, Exodus 4.23, and I say to you, let my son, that is Israel, go that he may serve me. Same word. So the people were saved from slavery in order to serve a new master, Yahweh. And here in Exodus 23.24, God warns them, don't fall into slavery again. Right? You shall not bow down to their gods nor serve them. And then he says in the next verse, you shall serve Yahweh your God. It's as if Yahweh is saying, don't you know I have already saved you from slavery to Pharaoh and to Egypt and to their pantheon of Egyptian gods? Why would you run and enslave yourself to another pantheon of false gods and goddesses? You serve me. And perhaps, perhaps some of us need to hear that this morning. That we have already been saved from slavery. On one hand, we have been saved from slavery to sin. And yet, my guess is that some of you this morning have run back to your old sins. That some of you this morning have run back to your old temptations in order to be enslaved by them once again. 
You, you have run back to the shackles of your former life. Shackles that the blood of Christ has freed you from. And yet you are there trying to put those shackles back on your feet and back on your wrists. And I want to say to you, don't you remember how destructive that slavery was before? Or don't you remember how that s- enslavement to sin destroyed your life and your marriage and your family and your relationships? Why would you run back to those cruel masters? Some of us, on the other hand, need to be reminded that we have been saved from slavery, not just to sin, but slavery to self-righteousness. We have been freed from that pharisaical lie that if we do enough good, that if we behave well enough, that if we check enough moral boxes, that then and only then will God love us. That then and only then will God look at us with his favor. And that too is a lie. Friends, we have been saved both from the slavery of sin and the slavery of spiritual performance, okay? We have been saved from those things. Therefore, it is the height of folly to run back to either of those things and seek to find hope or meaning or pleasure or comfort in them. You serve, church, you serve a new master. His name is Jesus, okay? Notice as well, Looking back at verse 24, how how the verse ends. He says there, you shall utterly overthrow them and break their pillars in pieces. I believe that the them there refers not to the people of Canaan. We'll get to that, but to their idols. And so I believe what's being communicated here is you are to utterly overthrow their idols. And not only that, but you are to utterly destroy the very pillars that were put into place as as these reminders of these Canaanite gods. Those two were to be destroyed. And I think there's an application for us here as well. The application is simply this. When we make a break from sin... When God, by his spirit, helps us to identify idols in our hearts and leave those idols, right, whether those are idols of pride or self-righteousness or control or lust or pornography or a forbidden relationship or materialism, when we identify those things in our hearts and leave them behind, we must not merely leave them behind. We must obliterate every last remnant, every last trace, every last pillar of that idol in our hearts so as to avoid any temptation to run back to them in a moment of weakness. It was not enough for the nation of Israel to say, we will not worship their gods because those pillars would have remained a temptation for idolatry. We, too, must destroy every last trace of idolatry in our hearts. Okay, that's the, the first requirement. The second requirement that God has for his people is that they expel the people of Canaan. So they reject the gods of Canaan. They expel the people of Canaan. Two things that we need to note here. The first thing to note is that we've already talked about the power to do this, right? The power to expel the people of Canaan is God's power, right? He is the one who sends his angel. He is the one who sends his terror. It says in here that he is the one who will send his hornets. Now, we have no idea what the hornets of Yahweh are. You want to do a dissertation? Have fun with that. But suffice it to say that when he would send his hornets... They would drive out the Hivites and the Canaanites and the Hittites from the land. So ultimately, it is God who provides the power to do this. But notice that Israel has a role to play. They're not just passive in this. Verse 31, For I will give the inhabitants of the land into your hand, and you shall what? Shall drive them out before you. 
So they have a responsibility in this. And this is the pattern that we see in the book of Joshua. Right? In Joshua, what we see constantly is that Joshua leads the people into the battle. God gives the people into their hands. And then Josh, Joshua successfully wins the battle and either drives the people out or destroys the people. So this is the first thing we need to see here. That God gives the power, but Israel still has a responsibility. The second thing we need to see here is why. Like why does God give them this command? Why were they to completely expel the people of Canaan from the land? See, what's interesting is if we were to keep reading, we would see that there are some passages where Israel was allowed to make treaties with non-Canaanite nations but not with these seven Canaanite nations. And the question is why? Let's look at verse 33. They shall not dwell in your land, lest they make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. Why does God give them this command? Here's why. This is a principle for us. Because it is always always easier to slide toward sin than it is to slide toward righteousness. Okay? It is always easier to slide toward idolatry than for our hearts to slide toward the true worship of God. See, if God's people failed to completely drive out the Canaanites and let the Canaanites remain in the land, the temptation to slide toward these people and to slide towards these gods would always be there. Just as a side note, this is one of the reasons why in pastoral counseling, we counsel those who are dating to not date non-Christians and not get married to non-Christians. Why? Because it is always easier to slide toward compromise and sin and idolatry than it is to slide towards conviction and godliness and righteousness. Okay? Friends, look at, look at Joshua. Look at what he says at the very end of his life in a prophetic way. Joshua 23, 11 through 13. Be very careful, therefore, to love Yahweh your God. For if you turn back and cling to the remnant of these nations remaining among you. Right? So when Joshua dies, there were still remnants of Canaanites in the land. And make marriages with them. Oh, it's so much easier to just make alliances with them, treaties with them, and not have to fight with them. So that you associate with them and they with you know for certain that Yahweh your God will no longer drive out these nations before you, but they shall be a snare and a trap for you, a whip on your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish from off this good ground that the Lord your God has given you. And that was what Joshua warned the nation of on his deathbed. And guess what happens, church? That's exactly what happens. The first chapter of the book of Judges contains this haunting refrain. It'll mention a tribe from the nation of Israel, and it'll say this, this tribe did not drive out the inhabitants of the land. And that refrain is repeated over and over and over. And what happens to the nation of Israel? They slowly descend into the idolatry of the people around them. <laughs> and then what happens? Instead of Israel expelling the other nations from the promised land, God sends foreign nations into the promised land to expel Israel. <laughs> And just like Adam and Eve were kicked out of Eden, so Israel is kicked out of the promised land. And the people of God once again find themselves homeless. But that's not the end of the story, is it, church? Just like Yahweh sent his angel before the people of Israel to safely deliver them into their home, the promised land, so Yahweh would send his son to safely deliver his new covenant people into their home, the new heavens and the new earth. And here's the catch. 
unlike the book of Exodus, instead of needing to expel the Canaanites from the land, what does Yahweh need to do? He needs to expel the sin of Canaan from our hearts. And guess how he does that? He sends his son to the cross. He sends his son into exile. He sends his son out of his presence into the depths of his judgment. And Jesus dies, dies on the cross to expel the guilt, the penalty, and the power of idolatry from our hearts. Jesus dies so that us covenant breakers might have our hearts washed clean. And in light of our clean hearts, we are invited home. Friends, we are homesick in our own homes. And we have been this way since Adam and Eve were kicked out of the Garden of Eden. But Jesus has made a way home. He has gone to prepare a place for us. And one day soon, he will come to safely bring us to our eternal and our perfect home. Let me end with the words of C.S. Lewis, speaking here about the best and most beautiful things on this earth. These things, the beauty, the memory of our past, are good images of what we really desire. But if, if they are mistaken for the thing itself, they turn into dumb idols breaking the hearts of their worshipers, for they are not the thing itself. They are only the scent of a flower we have not found, the echo of a tune we have not heard, news from a country we have never visited. The best and most beautiful things on earth, church, are only ever pointers to our future, our final, and our forever home with Christ. Friends, we are homeless and we are homesick, but there is a home that awaits us all. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that in Christ you are preparing a place for us. We thank you that in Christ our hearts have been made clean so that we can enter into your eternal presence, into our future home with confidence. We thank you that we were not ultimately made for this world, but that we were made to enjoy your presence for all eternity, in the new heavens and the new earth. Oh God, help us to live as people who long for and who have the hope of a forever home with you. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.